Now, we had better get home ourselves, said Mary. There's something funny about all this, I see, but must wait till we get in. They turned down the ferry lane, which was straight and well kept, and edged with large whitewashed stones. In a hundred yards or so, it brought them to the river bank, where there was a broad wooden landing stage. A large flat ferry boat was moored beside it. The white bollards near the water's edge glimmered in the light of two lamps on high posts. Behind them, the mists in the flat fields were now above the hedges, but the water before them was dark. With only a few curling wisps like steam among the reeds by the bank, there seemed to be less fog on the further side. Mary led the pony over a gangway onto the ferry, and the others followed. Mary then pushed slowly off with a long pole. The brandy wine flowed slow and broad before them. On the other side, the bank was steep, and up it a winding path climbed from the further landing. Lamps were twinkling there. Behind loomed up the buck hill, and out of it, through stray shrouds of mist, shone many round windows, yellow and red. They were the windows of Brandy Hall, the ancient home of the Brandy Bucks. Long ago, Gorhendad Old Buck, head of the Old Buck family, one of the oldest in Marish, or indeed in the Shire, had crossed the river, which was the original boundary of the land eastwards. He built and excavated Brandy Hall, changed his name to Brandy Buck, and settled down to become master of what was virtually a small independent country. His family grew and grew, and after his days continued to grow, until Brandy Hall occupied the whole of the low hill and had three large front doors, many side doors, and about a hundred windows. The Brandy Bucks and their numerous dependents then began to burrow, and later to build all round about. That was the origin of Buckland, a thickly inhabited strip between the river and the old forest, a sort of colony from the Shire. Its chief village was Bucklebury, clustering in the banks and slopes behind the Brandy Hall. The people in the Marish were friendly with the Bucklanders, and the authority of the master of the hall, as the head of the Brandybuck family was called, was still acknowledged by the farmers between Stock and Rushy. But most of the folk of the old Shire regarded the Bucklanders as peculiar, half-foreigners, as it were. Though, as a matter of fact, they were not very different from the other hobbits of the Four Farthings. Except in one point. They were fond of boats, and some of them could swim. Their land was originally unprotected from the east, but on that side they had built a hedge, the high hay. It had been planted many generations ago, and was now thick and tall, for it was constantly tended. It ran all the way from Brandywine Bridge in a big loop, curving away from the river to Hastened, where the Withywindle flowed out from the forest into the Brandywine, well over twenty miles from end to end. But, of course, it was not a complete protection. The forest drew close to the hedge in many places. The Bucklanders kept their doors locked after dark, and that also was not usual in the Shire. The ferry boat moved slowly across the water. The Buckland shore drew nearer. Sam was the only member of the party who had not been over the river before. He had a strange feeling as the slow gurgling stream slipped by. His old life lay behind in the mists. Dark adventure lay in front. He scratched his head, and for a moment he had a passing wish that Mr. Frodo could have gone on living quietly at Bag End. The four hobbits stepped off the ferry. Mary was tying it up, and Pippin was already leading the pony up the path when Sam, who had been looking back as if to take farewell of the Shire, said in a hoarse whisper, Look back, Mr. Frodo. Do you see anything? On the far stage, under the distant lamps, they could just make out a figure. It looked like a dark black bundle left behind, but as they looked, it seemed to move and sway this way and that, as if searching the ground. It then crawled, or went crouching, back into the gloom beyond the lamps. What in the Shire is that? exclaimed Mary. Something that is following us, said Frodo. But don't ask any more now. Let's get away at once. They hurried up the path to the top of the bank, but when they looked back, the far shore was shrouded in mist, and nothing could be seen. Thank goodness you don't keep any boats on the west bank, said Frodo. Can, can horses cross the river? 
They can go twenty miles north to Brandywine Bridge, or they might swim, answered Mary. Though I never heard of any horse swimming the Brandywine. But what have horses to do with it? I'll tell you later. Let's get indoors, and then we can talk. All right. You and Pippin know your way, so I'll just ride on and tell Fatty Bulger that you're coming. We'll see about supper and things. We had our supper early with Farmer Maggot, said Frodo. Uh, but we could do with another. <laughs> you shall have it. Give me that basket, said Mary, and rode ahead into the darkness. It was some distance from the Brandywine to Frodo's new house at Crick Hollow. They passed Buck Hill and Brandy Hole on their left, and on the outskirts of Bucklebury struck the main road of Buckland that ran south from the bridge. Half a mile northward along this they came to a lane opening on their right. This they followed for a couple of miles as it climbed up and down into the country. At last they came to a narrow gate in a thick hedge. Nothing could be seen of the house in the dark. It stood back from the lane in the middle of a wide circle of lawn, surrounded by a belt of low trees inside the outer hedge. Frodo had chosen it, because it stood in an out-of-the-way corner of the country, and there were no other dwellings close by. You could get in and out without being noticed. It had been built a long while before by the Brandybucks, for the use of guests or members of the family that wished to escape from the crowded life of Brandy Hall for a time. It was an old-fashioned, countrified house, as much like a hobbit hole as possible. It was long and low, with no upper story, and it had a roof of turf, round windows, and a large round door. As they walked up the green path from the gate, no light was visible. The windows were dark and shuttered. Frodo knocked on the door, and Fatty Bulger opened it. A friendly light streamed out. They slipped in quickly, and shut themselves in the light inside. They were in a wide hall with doors on either side. In front of them, a passage ran back down the middle of the house. Well, what do you think of it? Asked Mary, coming up the passage. We have done our best in a short time to make it look like home. After all, Fatty and I only got here with the last cartload yesterday. Frodo looked around. It did look like home. Many of his own favorite things, or Bilbo's things, they reminded him sharply of him in their new setting were arranged as nearly as possible as they had been at Bag End. It was a pleasant, comfortable, welcoming place, and he found himself wishing that he was really coming here to settle down in quiet retirement. It seemed unfair to have put his friends to all this trouble, and he wondered again how he was going to break the news to them that he must leave them so soon. Indeed, at once. Yet that would have to be done that very night, before they all went to bed. It, it's... it's delightful. He said with an effort. I hardly feel that I moved at all. <laughs> the travelers hung up their cloaks and piled their packs on the floor. Mary led them down the passage and threw open a door at the far end. Firelight came out and a puff of steam. A bath! cried Pippin. <laughs> oh, blessed Mary Dog! Which order shall we go in? said Frodo. Eldest first, or quickest first? <laughs> You'll be the last either way, Master Peregrine. Trust me to arrange things better than that said Mary. We can't begin life at Crick Hollow with a quarrel over baths. In that room there are three tubs and a copper full of boiling water. There are also towels, mats, and soap. Get inside and be quick. All right. Mary and Fatty went into the kitchen on the other side of the passage and busied themselves with the final preparations for late supper. Snatches of competing songs came from the bathroom mixed with the sound of splashing and wallowing. The voice of Pippin was suddenly lifted up above the others in one of Bilbo's favorite bath songs. Sing, hey, for the bath and close of day that washes the weary mud away. Hey, noon is he that will not sing. Oh, water hot is a noble thing. Oh, sweet is the sound of falling rain and the brook that leaps from hill to plain. But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. Oh, water cold we may pour at me Down a thirsty throat and glad indeed But better is beer if drink we lack And water hot pour down the back Oh, water fair that leaps on high With a fountain wide beneath the sky But never did fountain sound so sweet As splashing hot water with my feet <laughs> There was a terrific splash And a shout of from Frodo it appeared that a lot of Pippin's baths had imitated a fountain and leaped on high. Mary went to the door. What about supper and beer in the throat? He called. 
Frodo oh. came out drying his hair. There's so much water in the air that I'm coming into the kitchen to finish, he said. Logs, said Mary, looking in. The stone floor was swimming. You'll demob all that up before you get anything to eat, Peregrine, he said. Hurry up or we shan't wait for you. 